Hi, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone who uh, came to this panel today. Um, my name is Will Karolopoulos, I'm the Programming Coordinator for SBX. Um, and please join me in welcoming our panelists, Warren Craighead, Renee French, Aidan Koch, and Keith Mayers. I sort of, um, I kind of, um, what's the word I want to use? I sort of hyperbolically titled uh, this panel Perverse Comics Form. Uh, anyone who came here seeking erotica, I apologize in advance. Um, you know, but, but perverse, I'm sort of using another meaning of that word, which is something that's almost, almost comes across as if it's um, willfully uh, difficult or willfully against the grain. Uh, that's, a, that's another meaning of the word perverse. Um, and uh, I, I think one of the things that these four artists all have in common is that they do work that kind of contravenes um, the, the normal or conventional, if you like, uh, ways that comics have been structured and produced um, for much of the 20th century. Um, and, um, you know, we have, we have a, a kind of generation of alternative comics art that we were talking about in the last panel for anyone who was here that includes people like Dan Klaus and the Hernandez brothers uh, and Adrian Tomine, all of whom are here uh, today. Um, and they produce work um, that is um, magnificent in a variety of ways. Um, it's radical in a variety of ways. Um, uh, it, it completely transformed the notion of what kind of content comics could communicate. Um, but in many ways, artists like uh, Dan, who was here with us, um, are also coming from an old um, tradition of comics craftsmanship. So that when I teach um, classes about comics, for example, and we're talking about comics form, one of the things that I might point out is that uh, if you look at Ghost World, for example, by Dan Klaus, and we see an example page here, um, there are almost no um, panel layouts in Ghost World that you wouldn't find in Harvey Kurtzman's comics. Okay, he's using the same kind of three row format, um, you know, with each row of panels, uh, usually either having two or three or sometimes four panels in it, occasionally breaking into, you know, what you might think of as a widescreen kind of image. Now, within that, of course, um, there's a lot about it that's very much unlike Harvey Kurtzman's comics, from the maturity of the content, uh, the kind of idiosyncrasy of, of the visual style of Klaus's work is distinct. Um, and the pacing is certainly very different, even from a um, very sophisticated adventure comic like Kurtzman. So there's, there's a lot, obviously, that's quite different, but at the same time, he is coming out of a kind of um, tradition of comics craft. And that also applies uh, often to the tools uh, that artists work with as well. Uh, we have a history uh, in, in comics publishing of work that needs to uh, be drawn to survive a fairly crude process of reproduction. Uh, so that for most of the 20th century, anything that was drawn for comics had to be something that could withstand a pure black and white photograph that would be burned onto a plate, right? So we have this comics tradition of strong inking with these very clear outlines. And usually if there is color, it's added mechanically, as indeed it was in Ghost World. So anyway, that, I hope that's not too lengthy um, a preface, but I think what we're starting to see now is um, a kind of rising generation of artists um, for whom um, some of these traditional ways of making comics are maybe not as important for a variety of reasons. Um, I think um, there are some influences that we could talk about, um, uh, but also a big part of it is that um, technology has changed too. And now with digital scanning and digital printing, it's suddenly you know, possible and affordable uh, to print something that's drawn with you know, pencils and uh, watercolor or something like that. Um, and, and I think, um, additionally, uh, given the um, exploding diversity of the comics field, that kind of connection to a craft tradition that goes back maybe to the 40s and 50s is not quite as strong as it used to be. And there are, there are a million other reasons for this. Anyway, what I wanted to do today was talk to four artists who I think, um, in very different ways, um, are kind of contravening uh, traditional notions of comics form. Okay. Um, so, uh, I guess going alphabetically, we'll talk to Warren Craighead first. Um, 
uh, although hopefully we'll all talk to one another. I have some of your older work here, all of which is available on your website. So, I, I, right? so you know, I mean, it's fair game. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, I, there's nothing wrong with that. But you, this, this is uh, one of your early comics, and uh, it's called Speedy. I think it won a Sarah Grant, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, I haven't, to be honest with you, I don't have a print copy of this comic, but I, I've seen a number of example images online. Um, and it seems, in, in retrospect, looking even at these examples, on the one hand, it seems like um, it's not as traditionally narrative as maybe a lot of other work that might have been coming out at around the same time, but it's also very different from the work that you're doing now. Can you tell me, first of all, roughly when this came out? Um, that came out around 93, 94, and actually the, the panels we have there are um, from a series of comic strips I did before I did Speedy, so they're not the same thing. If you happen to find Speedy somewhere, you're, gonna, you're not going to find those opened up, but the, it's about the same thing. Drawn in a very cartoony style, but the narrative um, is, I, I, I wanted to put panels together the way a poet puts together lines of a poem, and so um, though the middle one is definitely a traditional sort of story, he's got a force field <laughs> and spooky tooth is trying to get in. Um, some of the other ones, um, I was trying to set up stories that didn't work as regular narratives, um, but sort of layered on top of each other the way that lines of a poem. I was at a poetry reading in Austin when I was in school there, and I was like, yes, I can make comic strips like that. Um, but you're right, I was still very much inside the cartooning tradition at this point. Thumbnails and penciling and then inking on top of that and um, trying to make it look um, as good as I could in terms of the traditional comics. What was your background? Did you grow up being really enthusiastic about comics? Yeah, I mean, I think I did traditional, like, reading superhero comics. Um, <coughs> then, um, in late high school, moving on to read some of the earlier comics by some of the heavyweights that are here this weekend, um, especially the Hernandez brothers. And then, um, through college, I, I, I went to, and this might be something that is happening with younger people now, I went to school and nobody where I went to school, none of the professors had anything to do with comics or anything about comics at all. And um, so there was no training, no sort of even feedback or, or support there. But I did get a lot of training in things like modern painting and learning all about fine arts and how the kind of ways that images can work together um, in less narrative ways. So I think that really fit into this early work um, and some of the later work as well, how, the, how you can make something that works together but isn't really a story. Um, the, the work of yours, I think, that I first remember seeing, or, the, well, that's not true. I think probably the first work of yours that I saw was probably some stuff in like those old SPX anthologies, actually. Yeah, I did a couple of collaborations with Ted May, which was really fun. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, I think I probably read that without maybe even uh, you know, like fully getting like who did what or whatever, you know, who was the artist, who was the writer or anything. The first it's funny, Ted wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny looking at you. So. Um, the first work that I recognized is, that I remember recognizing is yours, I think might have been one of these uh, zines like Jefferson Forest, it's the right. comic here. Um, and by this point, obviously the work has changed a lot. Um, I'm just going to show a few images from this um, mini-comic, but at this point you're clearly doing something that's very different. The work seems to be, um, in many ways, doing a lot of the things that comics do. You're sort of taking fragmented images, you're creating a reading path, you're combining text and image, um, but this has moved very far away, certainly um, from the more uh, traditional kind of comics that you've been drawing before. Um, can you talk a little bit how you got to the point um, of making work like this? Right, so I, um, I had been, I had pretty much two sort of sets of work. One was the comics work, which had you know, the cartoony style, and one was these pencil drawings of, of things, mostly at this time I was drawing suburban neighborhoods where I had grown up. And um, they started sort of coming together, and again, I remember uh, my, my wife was in school and she was studying and I, was, I would go to the library with her all the time to draw and I started just adding words to the actual drawings and uh, the, the pencil drawings that were more of my fine art work and 
it was almost like they, it was almost like they both just flowed together. And um, and I sort of a lot of the stuff fell away. The comics conventions fell away. Part of that is, I think, because I wasn't hanging out with anyone who made or read comics at the time. So the, none of them, they, they reacted as well to this as they did to my more traditional comic stuff. They, uh, they, they read it, and it had more of that sense of mystery and confusion, which I, I, um, I like, um, than um, the more traditional stuff. I also like that I could draw a ton of drawings, write a bunch of stuff, sort of mix and match, put them together until they started feeling like they worked well together. Um, and it just it felt right. I think it felt more like the things that I um, was interested in and that I enjoyed. Do you think the fact that you had um, contact with like a comics community or structure, whether, I mean, you mentioned that you were, like, you didn't have a lot of friends with comics, but you had a background of going to SPX. Well, only a couple, yeah, and only a couple times, too. Uh -huh. And I think, um, um, I had a much more strong, I had a much stronger community that was based in basically late modern and modern Spain. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of was much more, and, and poets too, but that was much more of a community that I, I knew and that I was with every day you know, when I was in school. So um, that way of thinking, you know, I suppose I had much more of an um, influence from Stuart Davis or George Brock or Picasso than, um, than Jack Kirby. I love that I think that that I think that also interrogation of form and how can we make these pictures work together and you know I, I read Scott McCloud's books when they came out and, and I think there was you know everyone has criticisms of Scott I think it's, it's they're great books though and but yeah words and images can go together in lots of different ways and not necessarily just in lots of different ways. and there are a lot of historical precedents for unconventional juxtapositions of word and image outside of the comics field, too. Um, I actually recently took a class on uh, the situationists and learned a little bit about the lecturists who preceded the situationists and their hypergraphics and metagraphics and visual yeah. poetry. And that's visual po and the metagraphics are sort of <coughs> visual poetry. There's a lot of concrete poets um, that I didn't know that much about at the time. Um, a lot of them come from typography, this sort of work of typography. Yeah, and, and you've certainly tapped into it very directly. Like you've um, talked about how these are calligrams by Paul. Can you just briefly mention like what these are and how you came to learn about yeah, them? Yeah, so these are these are actually these are um, by Apollinaire. Guillaume Apollinaire was a French poet in the early part of the 20th century. He was friends with Picasso and Brock, and um, a huge uh, proponent of their work. And um, he was, um, among other things. These calligrams, which are um, poems in visual form, and he was someone who I came across when I was drawing from and looking at a lot of cubist work, and um, I totally fell in love with the dude, um, and he, I, I, I did a big piece based on his work. Um, That's how to be everywhere. Yeah, how to be everywhere is a line. It's a line from a part of a line from one of his works, mm -hmm. um, and he he was someone who. Um, I felt rigorously interrogated the form that he inherited, which was a much more uh, sort of symbolist and uh, French poet poetry form, um, and um, tried to take it in all kinds of crazy places. And so I tried to do work <coughs> that reflected that. It didn't illustrate his work, but worked in the spirit of it. So um, that's what happened here. And it's also a rough sort of very foggy biography of him as well. Mm -hmm. Do you, I know, um, do you, when you're making something like this, I mean, this definitely seems strongly connected to the Jefferson Forest stuff that we were just looking at. Um, uh, do you think of this stuff as comics per se, or just something that kind of occupies a liminal space between the different practices that you work in? I guess I think of it as comics, though I wouldn't say it's cartooning at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I sort of draw the line, that I'm not a cartoonist. Um, not that there's anything wrong with cartooning. Mm -hmm. But I got into big trouble on a message board one day, <coughs> comments were once, because I said, comics is greater than cartooning, meaning that there's more to, comics can be more than just cartooning. Again, not that there's anything wrong. There's a line from Apollinaire where he's 
responding to his critics where he's like, you know, don't hate us, we want to give you vast new strange worlds, you know, I just want to add to them. Um, but I do think it sort of operates, if it does, on the edge of comics. I'm not sort of interested in really chopping up and deciding what comics have to where it doesn't happen. But I do put the images in sequence. Um, I didn't draw them in sequence, I didn't plan it out. I just drew tons of drawings and for this book, I moved all the furniture out of my living room and laid, you know, laid it out on the floor and moved things around um, until it seemed like a red, red room. And um, what, I think one of the things a lot of the panelists have in, in common too is working in multiple media. Um, you've also done some collage stuff, and to me, like I guess in retrospect, it almost seems like um, a natural progression because your images are so fragmented. Can you right. just talk a little bit about Yeah, this is also about Polynesia, <laughs> so you can okay. see my obsession. This is a piece for the Abstract Comics Anthology that Fan Graphics put out, and um, this um, is a, a history both of Cubism and of the Polynesia. Um, and I started doing, so um, in the early 90s, I was doing a lot of drawings, and then I started drawing on colored paper and cutting them up and putting them together as a way to bring some of the painting ideas of color and space into just drawings. Um, I'd always drawn and always tried to paint, and the paintings were always ter absolutely terrible. Um, I had a critique once where the professor, or not the professor's teacher, was like, why do you want to fail? Why are you doing this? You should be doing this drawings. <laughs> So I finally, it took me 15 years, but I finally listened to them. But, um, um, but I started chopping them up, putting them together. My day job, I'm a um, designer, and um, so I, I, I'm very comfortable with digital manipulation images. And so um, I also think a lot of this is just digital collage, as well, sort of chopping things up and putting them back together. Um, but I agree with you, I think that it, it feeds off of old, older work where chunks can be made to relate to each other. Um, and I know you've also like exhibited some of this work, uh, including the collages, it's just an image that I found online, some images yeah. for your exhibitions. Um, how do you feel, does that presentation affect the way that the work is received? You mean that, that it's in a gallery set? Yeah, doing your group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have a show, anyone who's in the DC area, I have a show opening at the Ralph Art Center here in DC in a couple weeks. Um, and um, I, I think it, it does, I mean, for that show, I did a bunch of big collages and then um, the book, um, but I have had comic stuff on the walls, and it, it, I think I have it easier than a lot of comics people, because um, if you, you know, you might see a beautiful page, a page by a cartoonist, and it's up on the wall, but it's out of context, it's out of where it was originally meant to be seen, which really is a printed. Whereas I, the work I do, I can work on it as a collage, scan that in or chop it up, um, and fit it together to work as a printed piece as well. So, um, um, I'm gonna, I'd like to ask uh, R Renee a few questions and show some of her images. Renee actually sent me a few pictures and I incorporated a couple of them. This one here, I hope I put the right one in. I think you told me it's like the first comic you ever ever drew. It was. I, um, I thought of it when I went to the bathroom one day. I was at work, and I went into the stall, and, I, and it just like sort of hit me. So that and it and I had to sneak draw this. Like I had a little, you know, eight little tiny piece of paper, and I would draw one panel, and then when my boss would come around, I would hide it under the tick file and then bring it out. So it's in pieces, and then I had to paste it together. But yeah, that's the very first sequential. Did you have um, a background as a comics reader or any aspirations to yeah. drawing that kind of thing? I read art, like Richie Rich. <laughs> but no. Why do you think at that point you started drawing something that was in the comics form? Um, at the time, I, actually, I owned a comic book store. That's why. You owned a comic book store? Really? Yeah. Okay. It was very short lived. How did you get into in that um, uh, um, My ex-husband, my husband at the time, was into comics, and we had you know a little bit of money and bought this place. It was really pretty stupid, but um, it was a cute little place in Philly, and we you know there was Fat Jacks, which was this amazing big comic book store, and then we were this tiny little place, and I was like, 
we're just going to have the indie stuff here. And so kids would come in and go, where's the X-Men? And I'm like, Ugh. and they'd leave. <laughs> and then, and so we couldn't pay the rent, and we lasted about, I don't know, I think it was less than a year we lasted, probably. Were you doing any other kind of art? Did you have an art background? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a fine art major, and I was doing these like tiny little drawings, the colored drawings, colored pencil drawings, and trying to exhibit them, but, and nobody really wanted tiny little things to put on their wall, so, um, yeah. And I saw Raw and Yummy Fur. That was a thing for me, Yummy Fur was a real big deal. And that was amazing. I fell in love with Chester Brown <coughs> and Julie Doucet, and I thought, you can do this, like you can make your art and put it in a thing and where you can turn the pages and it's still art, but you can, you know, other people can see it. They don't have to see it on the wall somewhere. You can hold it. And you published, you went on to publish several um, comic book format publications. These are uh, a few great bath covers and there's some other titles. Um, and. Uh, did you see this work as being um, sort of related to other stuff that Panagraphics might have been publishing or that other alternative comics publishers might have been publishing? Did it feel like this was work that had a, a sort of scene around it? That was the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And there were, um, yeah, there were a bunch of people who were doing these, everything was pretty like sexy, drugsy kind of raw-like stuff. That it's not around as much anymore, that kind of thing. It was also very like black and white and gritty and, and um, stream of consciousness stuff. And uh, <coughs> I did something for real stuff, and then Gary Brock said, how about a one shot? And I did the first issue of Grip Hat. And he said, you can do whatever you want. And I did, and it was like, a lot of it was, and it was banned in Canada, and it was banned in England, and it was, <laughs> and you know, I did, my mom's never seen it. It's interesting, you know, I, I uh, probably, uh, well, I, I, I'm seeing some of this uh, artwork from your early comics sort of for the first time now, having read a lot of your other stuff, like TK and some of your other books. Um, and it's interesting to me that you started out um, in this kind of, you know, pen, doing this pen and ink work uh, with a much more um, sort of traditional comic look approach to, you know, pen, breaking down a page and using word balloons and I things like that. I thought I had to, though. I thought it was law mm -hmm. that you had to do, that you had to, you know, right? break it down into like, I mean, I remember even looking at stuff and going and counting the panels on the page. And going, okay, so it's what, what is it? It's nine panels per page? Okay. And breaking it down into nine panels per page. Because I wasn't looking at Marvel and DC and stuff. I was looking at you know, Chester Brown. I was looking at, at um, Julie. And they all seemed to do that. It was very regimented like that. So I thought that those were the rules I had to teach myself how to do it. And it seems like um, a couple of shifts happened in your work over time. Certainly one of them had to do with materials. I mean, you really started to shift. I don't know exactly when, this is just one example. Um, but at a certain point, you really started to shift more towards this kind of um, softer um, uh, graphite uh, way of making work. Um, how did you, and, and this is just a, a, an even later example, Um, how did this, how did this evolution happen in your comics? Um, I loved pen and ink, but it actually wasn't doing the thing I wanted it to do, and it wasn't soft enough. You know, I wanted some kind of weight. I was also making photographs, a lot of photographs at the time, and I wanted some way to make depth of field, that, like, to look visible, and I tried that with cross hatching, but it was really rough. So um, in 2000, the association in France, they put together a 2,000 page anthology 
from all over the world, people from all over the world. So there was, and it was a wordless. And, um, and I, I just thought, I mean, what if I drew with a black Prismacolor pencil instead of that ink? And I tried it, and then that was it. I was, after that, I just couldn't touch ink anymore, because it was, I, I, and this was not the first one, but it's not, it did involve those two kids with the reckoning. Um, and did you continue, like I've seen a lot, um, I mean I don't know, these are some images you sent me, I'm not sure how old or recent they are, but I know that you produce a lot of drawings that aren't necessarily intended to be seen within a narrative context. Um, did you always kind of, like Warren, like Warren was talking about how he had a drawing practice and a comics practice, was that also true for you? I think I have this sort of internal battle, like uh, I get sick of comics and I think, why not? I'll just make individual <coughs> pictures. That would be rewarding. And then I do it, and I make some individual things, and I have a show, and they're on the wall and stuff, and I just think, is that it? Like, <laughs> is this the payoff? Like, go to the opening and have cheese, and then <laughs> <laughs> and it goes, oh, I really like them, and, and then it's just, I, I don't, it's just there's no, there's no sort of, um, there's no walking around figuring shit out, you know? You're like, it, for me anyway, I have to have a puzzle. So then I end up going back to comics and I tell a story. And that's what happens, I go back and forth. So that girl with the thing on her head and the hair with the stuff wrapped around it, those were both for they're two different shows. And they were really fun, but it's just, I don't know, there's just no payoff for me. I can't with it long enough. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting is it kind of seems like, um, you know, as your comics have developed, that you, you've moved, um, you've really refined your visual style, and it's highly recognizable, but you keep um, sort of changing your approach to um, the, the comics form. And, you know, I know you've done some picture books, like The Soap Lady, um, and, and a couple of others under a pseudonym. You know, those books, uh, you know, picture books tend to have a very different kind of approach to the visual exposition. It's not about, you know, breaking down the page into nine panels and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way your book H Day is structured, because, uh, you know, in some ways, it's like an artist's book, it's like a children's book, it's like an avant-garde comic in that, or an avant-garde graphic novel, and that you've got, um, this wordless book that has two sort of related narratives unfolding simultaneously um, on the left and right hand uh, pages. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you came to decide upon that form for that book? That book is like, was, I kind of gave myself a really difficult puzzle. I mean, that's kind of what that was. I was drawing, I was making a little animations, line drawing animations, the most difficult way you can do it. I was, I mean, I sort of had my, um, my, ca my camera, my, that you talk to on your, on your, I don't know what it's called, on um, the computer where you, was it, it was when they weren't in the computer. One of those little globes oh, that you sit on top. Yes, I said, I had an eyesight camera and I like, sort of faced it down and then I made a drawing and then I took a picture, and then I erased, and I drew, and I did that, and I was making animations. And I realized, this is kind of cool that every time I erase this thing, the original thing is gone. And there's just sort of a little bit, you can see a little bit, it's like uh, William Kentridge, where you, he has this amazing thing where he makes a drawing, and he takes a picture, and then he erases and changes it, and there's a memory of what the action was because of the stuff that was erased and you could see it. And so I started doing that, and um, I kept, I, I took a picture of each one. So on the left-hand side of this book, there's this animation that happens, individual shots of this animation. And then on the right, um, I, I was drawing the internal thing that happens when you have a migraine, this sort of, and it's story of the migraine dog going through hell and everything. but. My idea was that 
what if I had the two things going individually, but at the same time, there might be visual elements that link the two together, but really ambiguously. Like, why not be really difficult? <laughs> and so that's what I did, because I was kind of pissed off at, like I hated narrative all of a sudden. It was like making me puke. And I didn't want e exposition I hated. I hated anything that had to do with like storytelling uh, suddenly. Screw that. Like, you know, I just, so that's, it was a, like a reaction to that. Like I was making these stories and I, I had to follow the structure and then I just, it's, it's very angrily done. But, um, and then I read that I love how it came out. I was very happy with it, but it's not an easy sell. People are, what is this thing? What's the story? Is it two stories or is it one story? Yeah, and that, I mean, that's sort of like where that, um, you know, sort of the that notion of like the kind of perverse approach to making stuff, the idea you know, that word is often used when something is willfully difficult, it is interesting to be said, let's, let's be difficult, you know, because I feel like there is, uh, you know, Chris Ware was on, uh, did a Q&A in this room earlier today, and he said one of the things, one of the differences between comics and fine art is in fine art, if you look at the work and you don't get anything, you're stupid. If you read a comic and you don't get it, you think the artist is stupid. You know? <laughs> um, whereas, you know, I think uh, in this case, you know, there, I think there is a middle ground, a kind of, um, you know, a willingness to make difficult comics or to at least ask the reader to apply a little bit of effort or meet you halfway or, you know, have uh, maybe, you know, an open mind um, and not have the same kind of, apply the same kind of expectation. I don't think I could have done that book with any other publisher than Picture Box. I mean, some maybe some smaller ones, but like if I had pitched that to Top Shelf or something, you know, I mean, Chris Starrs would have been like, I don't think so. I mean, we have to make this be a story, you know, but the Picture Box, it's, it could be an art book, it could be whatever I wanted it to be, you know, there. Um, Aiden, I wanted to um, show some images from your work because one of the things we've seen is how like, you know, Renee, for example, when she entered the comics field, it was almost like presumed that, like, you're going to make a comic book, it's going to have this many pages, it's going to be drawn with pen and ink, you know. And I think, um, I don't know exactly how long you've been making comics, but I feel like I've started seeing your work a lot over the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, about when would you say you started making comics? In, I mean, really, I, I started my first year of college. So, yeah, I think I started my first year mm -hmm. or so. But some of the first things I did were pretty traditional, or like they came from a more illustration-based style. I looked at like Mark Todd and Esther Pearl Watson a lot. It was like kind of my ideals for work. And then shifted completely like halfway through school. And that's more like everything that's presented of mine now, mm -hmm. kind of like tucked away. Uh -huh. And um, were you in an art school? Mm -hmm. uh, what were you, were you in like a fine arts program or something? Yeah, I did illustration studies at um, Pacific Northwest College of Art. Okay. And so I mean that, in Portland, Oregon, and there's a strong base there for comics, and like a lot of my fellow students were really interested and involved in making comics and scenes. So just through them, I kind of got exposed to a lot of stuff really fast. Mm -hmm. And you said that there was a shift in your work at a certain point, and it all started to look maybe more like the work you produced since then. What, um, I just want to show a few uh, example images. This is from um, one of your longer pieces called The Whale. It was published by Gaze Books, and this is uh, in pencil with graphite. These are some uh, pages from a four-page full-color story, um, just to show some examples of this. Um, and. Like, what, how would you characterize that shift? Like, would, were there interests in your other fine arts practice that you were bringing into comics, or were you becoming frustrated with trying to work in a more traditional way? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing was I ended up um, getting really obsessed with just figure drawing and life drawing, where I, I came back to those roots after like a year or two of school and was like, I really am drawn to that foundation and like having that particular skill set be really powerful. I mean, more so sometimes than just doing like mark making and kind of loose cartooning. Um, so 
So I just really, really focused on drawing the things around me. And even, yeah, it's kind of getting into like abstracting those things. I made a lot of scenes at the time that were like pretty personal and started working with developing, you know, creating words and lists that went along with these like figure drawings that I was doing. Um, and one of the things that, um I mean, there's a lot of, of, about this work uh, that's really interesting. You mentioned the kind of abstraction sort of combined with the more naturalistic figure drawing. Um, and in terms of form, you know, there are a lot of things that you're doing in these, even in these few pages uh, that we're looking at here where, you know, like you know, you're filling up an entire panel with just like a word or two. Um, you're, or, um, you know, you've got this kind of very clear organization of images on a page, but it's not, you know, ruled out like a traditional comics page. Um, uh, and, you know, and there are multiple examples of this kind of, of thing in your work. Um, were, there, were there models uh, to you for this kind of less, um, you know, conventional way of laying out a comics page? Was there anyone who you were looking at, or were you just dropping uh, the conventions and then just sort well, of inventing your own solutions? Yeah, because I think at first, when I was doing zines, I wasn't considering comics. I had kind of put that away for a while. But the way I was developing zines was what really transferred over into like, oh, well, I can show this figure twice and then have this you know, thing that I want to say that will relate somehow or, you know, just kind of, yeah, taking these different subject matters and flowing them together. So focusing a lot on text pretty like heavily and then kind of leaving it up to the images to create the feeling or like leave guesswork for whoever was reading it to kind of associate those things. And yeah, when I started like, you know, dividing up into panels, I kept a lot of that going of just having like the text be this really strong, kind of setting the tone for the work. Um, yeah, but I I became friends with a few people that were pretty influential just to like have around. Um, Blaze Larney and Jason Overby, who they used to do a blog, Comics Comics, that was like a take on Comics Comics, where they just had like long esoteric discussions on theories they had, and kind of just messing around, really, and talking about form and functionality with comics, and just like getting in with people who are already thinking so beyond the, the normal structure was really, really great. Um, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the media that you use. Um, some of the stuff seems like it's pretty straight. Uh, it, it's done entirely in graphite, or black and white, and then photo copy. Um, you've also done a lot of full color work. We saw some examples. This is a book that you just self-published with the Zara Grant um, called The Blonde Woman. Um, can you talk a little bit about the materials that you use for this work? Yeah, I use gouache, ink, colored pencil, and just regular pencil for, for pretty much everything now. I'm usually like on tone paper. Um, and really, like from my fine art practice, that was what I was using. I was really dedicated to that and working on like nice papers. And I think I just mostly did a lot of pencil work because I didn't know how to print anything in color yet. Like I didn't have the money. I have you know, particular quality that I want to get out of it that just photocopying wouldn't really capture. So it was kind of like building up to getting to do more color work. But having the internet is really great in presenting that work. But it's interesting because people would ask like, where are your color books? What's going on? I see it online. Why don't you have anything yet? Mm -hmm. Right, so this was a story that was serialized online. Mm -hmm. So in that case, like, you can scan anything and the media don't matter at all, obviously. Yeah. It can be made out of glue and pixie sticks, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would recommend that. Um, <laughs> uh, and, what, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about this, too, is um, you have, like, uh, there's a lot of abstraction here. You mentioned before, like, getting abstraction into the work, and sometimes you, know, you have these, um, you know, pages that almost seem like, uh, you know, com almost a composition of nearly 
abstract stuff, like a page like this one where you have the one figure, um, but the other panels, you know, outside of context, maybe could just be taken as abstract, even though they have a meaning in the story. And then at other times, um, you you do use almost a very traditional like comic book layout, like here uh, in the sequence, you have a character you know, like braiding her hair or you know, the candle sort of burning down uh, at the end of the day. Um, have you started to get like a sense in your work of when this kind of thing is maybe um, helpful for your narratives and when you might want to step away from it and use other approaches? Yeah, I feel like that's been a big lesson that I've been learning developing like new projects is especially with creating pacing and like yeah playing with time just like going back through books and figuring out like <coughs> areas that I want to draw out more it yeah having an image that you're like slowly doing changes almost like an animation you know it helps slow everything down and helps the reading work in a way that is more powerful to what I'm trying to say rather than if you have too many like you know juxtaposing images it it reads in just a different way and since so much i like want to focus on the tone of the story i yeah i've been learning how to use that in a more effective way i think and uh, both warren and renee talked a little bit about like the difference between like work for exhibition and work for print you exhibited some of your work i found these images online mm -hmm. and you know you You've got some stuff here that's sculptural. Um, we have some single images. Uh, it seemed as if there were some single images in, in these exhibitions um, that aren't necessarily associated with a, a larger narrative. Um, do you, um, how, how do you see, do you, well, I guess, I mean, there are any multiple questions I could ask about that. Do you think the work is received differently, or do you perceive that work differently yourself if it's intended for a kind of installation context versus for a publication or for a narrative? Yeah, I had a few years where I was showing quite a bit, like more so than I was working on scenes and comics. And I mean, I think Renee really touched on it where I kind of, I'm at this point now where I, I have a few shows every year and when I put them together, there's kind of this sense of lacking in like what I get out of it. Um, Whereas, you know, it's exciting to put together single images and have a show, but then I had something about creating a story and creating an object that you can, like, share with people beyond that one experience of, like, an opening. And just, I don't know, it's, it is so much more powerful, I guess, to get that out there and to, like, share a whole experience rather than, like, an image, which is more, Yeah, it's been something I've been thinking about a lot with showing. But definitely working in different mediums is still something I'm very into. It was in like ceramics and exploring like fabrics and things just as a practice. And Keith, I gather that these particular <coughs> issues of like exhibition versus publication are really central to your life as well. Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, I grew up in Colorado and so in the 70s, and we had a great art museum, if you like Frederick Remington statues, and uh, Native American art, I love Native American art as much as the next person, Frederick Remington was still on the, on the <laughs> but uh, uh, my access to art was really through comics, it was through uh, the New Yorker magazine, some of my dad was bringing home, and um, also just, you know, going to the comic book store and seeing the mainstream comics, but also, you know, underground comics and also heavy metal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't really, I was a fine art major as well as a semiotics major around uh, as an undergrad, but it wasn't really until I moved to New York that I realized that you could do fine art as a career, that that was something you could do. I just never had access to it. So I think a lot of politics come into this about um, class and access. I think that, uh, you know, uh, Duchamp said, taste is habit. And I kind of think what that means is that you habitually learn to like the things that you see the most, that are taught to you, that are accepted within your realm. I've taught comics at SBA for about 16 years. I've taught uh, fine art at NYU and now at Columbia for many, many years. And I find a lot of the differences between my students are class and race. A lot of the fine art students um, happen to be 
mostly white, mostly upper middle class or upper class. They used to, they, a lot of them have family members that have taken them to museums and galleries, or they went to private schools where they had really good art history programs and things like that. Whereas my SBA students are everybody. Um, and honestly, and, and not to stereotype, but a lot more working class kids uh, than not. And uh, that is really gratifying to me that, you know, art should be for everybody. Some of the SBA kids are really wired to tell stories through weird image combinations, but many of them just grew up doing what it is they had access to. And I also think in terms of how the work circulates, they've said that that high-low high debate's been over for eons, but it hasn't, it's not. It's definitely still very much entrenched. Um, I curated a show at what used to be MoCA, the Museum of Comics and Cartoon Art in New York, and uh, it was interesting to me because a lot of the older generation cartoonists did not want to participate in the show, maybe a little bit because of MoCA, uh, but also just because they want to see their work re reproduced in a book, and they don't really feel that's on the wall. And also there's sort of this entrenched, uh, you know, reverse snobbery that fine arts for rich white people, um, which it is a little bit, but luckily the fine art world's gone smarter. There are a lot more people participating exhibiting and showing and, and seeing things, as well as buying some of the work and, and people recording galleries, whereas comics are for everybody. Um, which for me, you know, I love teaching at SBA because I, I feel it uh, keeps me from getting hit by lightning. Um, and also just because I never want to do work exclusively for rich white people or the rarefied world of uh, the galleries. I really want to have my work seen for everybody. And I've been born as the comics kid on campus since I was in elementary school. Uh, but I think it, a lot of politics come to play. You know, and in fine art, it, it, in the semiotics of comics, which are word image combinations that together form their own language. It's really intense. It's very much like a saussure idea of the sign where you have a signifier and a signified, where you have the object that would be a tree and a word that addresses that object. Uh, working together as a sign, a linguistic sign that comics is you know, very much a, an illustration of, where you have words that say something that guides you to what the images kind of mean and what the images do. It amplifies and adds music, which just says a thousand words that creates an emotion or a synesthesia around that language. And then when you put one panel next to another panel and have it form longer sentences and stories, that's amazing. And I think the fine art world has finally, at least in the West, um, gotten smarter and realized that comics have this amazing language that really a lot of other art doesn't have access to. And they're really interested. I mean, I think comics are a subsidiary of fine art, obviously. Of a, you know, Goya and uh, Le Capricious, Hogarth. Uh, I think most art before the Renaissance was about pictures and juxtaposed sequence that were delivered sequence in the cloud definition that tell a story. And it was really the Renaissance where they tried to want to get it into one picture. I think in New York, the New York School of Abstraction, with Clement Greenberg and Rosenberg, having things sort of titans of criticism and saying only well, yeah, abstract painting is cool. A lot of people who were doing figurative narrative allegory went into illustration just for their work to be seen. Um, but now I think fine art really is interested in comics as a language and getting access to that. And uh, luckily, like uh, great galleries like David Swerner are showing art crumb, uh, and they're making a market for it, which is very important for a gallery. You know, a gallery is supposed to be about ideas and not about money, but they substitute was open, and with our crumb selling, it's creating a market for a comic art to be shown in galleries' context. But still, in fine art, you know, there are a lot of you know gallerists who have never heard of Juxtapose magazine and think it's weird when you show it to them. I know at the Columbia MFA program, which was an which is an excellent program, um, I have students there who are doing word image combinations. There are comics. They're in the print program and stuff. And a lot of the artists that come through, a lot of the teachers say, well, can't you do this without the words? Like, what about taking the words out? And I'm like, no, keep the words in. And they're like, thank you. You know, finally, there's somebody saying that you keep the words in here. I'm like, duh, you know, Raymond Pettibone. You know, there are people in the fine art world who do this, and yet a lot of the teachers and artists of an older generation um, didn't have access to comics. They still think it's about um, Richie Rich, even though I love Richie Rich. 
Um, and they, they just, they aren't smart. They're ignorant. Um, and they're trying to guide the students to get away from that and do an oil painting that doesn't have words in it because they don't understand it. It's weird like that. But it, luckily it's changing. I know a younger generation of people like Dash Shaw and friends have no problem showing something on the wall as well as having it printed in a book. And the fluidity of the worlds that is, is much more accessible and much more part of their taste. And it's expected almost. And so luckily things are changing. I want to just show a few images of your work because you have, I mean, your principal, you, you know, you, I think your two primary activities, as I'm aware of them, is that you're a teacher of nature. Um, and you've also produced a graphic novel called Former Hospital on the Club. Um, I just wanted to put up a couple of uh, images of your paintings because I think one of the things that they demonstrate is that they do sort of address that kind of high low divide. I mean, it, like this Life magazine painting, you're like literally painting. A printed piece of ephemera mm -hmm. and as, as an oil painting, you know, where you were, um, you know, sequence. yeah, engaging, uh, you know, popular culture, obviously, in your, in your paintings um, and so on. This is a more uh, recent image from a more recent series. Um, I think everyone in the audience recognizes the subject of that portrait. Um, but I wanted to um, ask you about this book, Horror Hospital Unplugged. Uh, it was first published in 1996, and it was republished in a new edition last year, so yeah. you can see the two covers. I have the um, older one. Um, and this is a book that I feel like was um, very ahead of its time. It was not published by a comics publisher. It was published, I guess, by Juno Books and Research, you know, some kind of collaboration. It went after research and it had sort of separated and Andrea Juno sort of split off and started her own line. But like, research was uh, like the publisher that kind of created alternative culture in like the 80s and 90s. They published the first book called, what was it, like Urban Primitives or something like that. It was about extreme tattooing and facial piercing and stuff and essentially created a lot of things that first were part of alternative culture and then now are just part of mainstream culture. Um, and Dennis Cooper um, is, is someone who a lot of people I know uh, really respect as a kind of, um, well, as a novelist who takes a kind of, you know, non-conventional, non-PC approach to the culture, yeah, transgressive. Um, but I mean, I think he's still kind of a cult figure in some yeah, ways. Sure. Can you talk just briefly about how this book even came about yeah. and how you, because this is, I guess, based well, on a Dennis Cooper story or a collaboration with Dennis Yeah, I, I went to UC Irvine, and uh, it was funny because I really came from a comics tradition, and I wanted to like sort of hunker down after um, trying to uh, submit 10 cartoons a week to the New Yorker. I was in the meantime working at uh, art galleries and things, and I realized like, maybe I don't have to make things that are just funny all the time, but comics are about bringing up ideas aesthetically, and I could do that with fine art. In fact, that's what a lot of this one of art's about, so I went to grad school. But I found my vernacular in grad school was really just to stick to my guns and do a comic-like story. So I did one called Pinocchio, the Big Fag. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in 93, and uh, it was as a series of images that told a story, but as if they were um, done in different styles, as if my version of Pinocchio existed along with the original, and some gay collector got them all put them together in a row, and I cast famous characters in this, like Keanu Reeves was Lamp Wick and John Wayne was Geppetto and so on. Anyway, Dennis saw the show and he really liked it. We became friends and hung out with him one day we were at a stereo lab concert, I think, and he said, Keith, would you like to do a graphic novel? I said, for sure. And he had this uh, short story um, that was about a band uh, starring this guy, Trevor Machine, and he said, would you like to adapt it to a graphic novel? And I said, absolutely, because I really want to give my work to the people. And so, even though I was starting to show galleries and so on, I took time out and he gave me a script that was sort of like a brief movie script, and then um, I was able to adapt it any way I wanted, and I brought it back to him, and he, he liked it, and he would write the next chapter, and that's how it worked. But his agent showed it to Andrea Juno, she was psyched about it, and this was really before a lot of the graphic novel scene had started to happen. Certainly before a lot of gay comics were out there. Howard Cruz came out with uh, Stuck Rubber Baby right around the same time, but I felt that it was a queer comic, both in terms of its sensibility of not being like a gay Judy Garland thing, but also it was queer in terms of how I wanted to structure the format and make it a little bit more abstract. Yeah, and that's that to me is one of the things that really stands out about this because you mentioned, for example, Dash, who uh, I don't know if Dash is one of your students, yeah, but I know. Is. 
you know, he went to SVA. You know, and Dash, like there's, there's a lot that you know stands out about Dash's work, and certainly, you know, he's not afraid to have you know the visual style sort of transform throughout the course of the book. He doesn't get too fussy about you know does this character look on the model from panel to panel? He doesn't get too fussy about you know does am I using the same media for the background as any of the characters or something? You know, he had, and all of that stuff now seems very contemporary. In the mid '90s, from you know, really the, when you were making Brick Bad, you know that kind of approach was rare. I think. You know, I mean, you see you see signs of it maybe in like Rene Frenchman, Julie Dussay's work a little bit. You know, she was, um, uh, you know sometimes you know really distort the characters from panel to panel. But it was it was not conventional, you know, uh, even in alternative comics. And so yeah, I just want to throw. Um, some images uh, from this book up, just so that people can get a sense of it. I feel like in this book you're um, creating a kind of cartoon vocabulary that's really um, uh, heterogeneous throughout, and that's also drawing from a lot of sources that were part of comics culture. I feel like there's like bits and pieces of like Ralph Steadman in here, and, and, and other artists who we might think of as cartoonists. And so it's kind of really, so what you were saying about cartooning versus and even what we think of as cartooning in comics is sometimes narrower than the cartooning. You know, we don't think of Hogarth necessarily as the description, or you know, Ralph Steadman as someone who's relevant to comics. Or well, you know, I, I, this was really for me and homage a lot to the art history as well as comics history. You know, I was starting to look at the, the very few mangas that had been uh, popularized. Don't try the sequence at home, by the way. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think style is form is content, and I really like the idea of developing an image to create an emotional synesthetic where you're looking at it, but you feel it to response. I realize if you can nuance the style of things to, to manipulate that, that could be an excellent strategy in an avant-garde form that, I mean, we weren't expecting anybody to really um, get this bureaucracy and I mean, like the research line of books just because they'd be in the dusty corner at the uh, used record store. Um, and so I felt like I had a great degree of experimentation. And also coming from a you know postmodern ideology of appropriating styles for content, I felt like I could have free license here. And so I was looking at a lot of underground comics, really from the 60s for guidance. I love Ralph Steadman, but then I real, realized Ralph Steadman comes from like George Gross and Otto Dix and the Dubuca artists and going back to the source you know, in terms of fine art, um, and just trying to be able to be able to uh, mix and match uh, all these different diverse styles of histories to form that story. I also love how like Snoopy changes over time. Mm -hmm. you know, the early Snoopy looks totally different from the 80s Snoopy, um, and yet that's something that we're conditioned not to really think about too much, but I felt like you could move those styles around depending on the personality and what's going on within the characters. and so. You know, there's a gay love sequence that's done in a yaoi kind of style, but it gets really expressionist. I actually have some of those images. Yeah, so. yeah this is, I want, did want to ask you very specifically about this, because that's one of the other things that seems kind of ahead of its time about Horror Hospital Unplugged, is that you're like, I, I remember seeing this before um, manga was really big in our yeah. culture, and it just seems, I was like, what is this like speed racer stuff? You know, like, I mean, it just seems well, surprising to me, but yeah. now in retrospect, it's like, show me a young artist who is in some way, you know, influenced by or has had some. Well, when I was still in college, Frank there. Miller had gotten popular enough to be able to do Ronan, and, and then he was able to get Lone Wolf and Cub translated for doing the covers. And then for some reason, they released Tezuka's Adolf, which was a sort of weird, rarefied Tezuka. Um, but I was going to Japan to LA and getting this shoujo, and I realized, like, oh my gosh, you know, shoujo is such an advanced comic medium because it was about displaying emotion on a page uh, rather than the sort of exterior that's going on. It's almost like you were in the brain of the characters, in, in the compositions themselves. They really can move you through this field of what's going on in the tier of a character. And so I'm so glad that, you know, Fantagraphics is uh, reproducing Moto Hachio now, mm -hmm. with Drunken Dreams and other stories. I really recommend it. It's just 
revolutionary comics, if you think that uh, shoujo is all about fruits basket, you know, go back to the source of these women who are really changing comics form. But then also I would mix them that set up with like Odin and Renan and, and expressions and styles. And I have to say too, with my, my gallery shows, I do think of them as comics on the wall. You extracted a few images, but really in each show, I think of each painting in successive order telling a bigger story. Hopefully each one stands on its own, but I really think thematically I can't help but think about what image goes after the other. And I put it, even the, but fine art people have a hard time with that too. If you see a bunch of paintings, you just think it's a bunch of paintings. It's hard for them to get it. But hopefully they're getting smarter. Okay, um, you know, I feel like this is a conversation we could have for like another hour. Uh, and I think it's precisely because, uh, you know, for a long time now, comics has had an engagement with the literary world. And that's had its pros and cons. And we're just beginning to see a stronger engagement with the art world. And I think, you know, we see it in the work, and a lot of people have been thinking about this stuff for a long time, but it hasn't come up a lot. Unfortunately, I'm, we're running over time, so I'm going to have to. I have to say, the comics world is getting smarter too. The abstract comics book is amazing. I'm so happy that we could even have this conversation. Yeah, and and please, I invite you all to continue this conversation with all of these artists and to pick up their books uh, here at the show as well. Please join me in thanking them for. Your